Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to Edisat Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in Computer Sciences, we will be talking about computer memory. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert Dr. Pavitra Bharadwaj. Dr. Bharadwaj is Assistant Professor in Department of Computer Sciences in Jesus Marriage College, University of Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Thank welcome ma'am. Thank you sir. Hello friends. Today we are going to talk about a very important aspect in computer hardware that is computer memory. Basically we talk about computers as a system because it has several components which work together. When I say components I basically mean the different subsystems of the computer system like the input, the processing unit, the output unit and the storage unit. So, what we are talking about is that how data is managed, how data is stored in the computer's memory. So, basically the computer memory has the storage unit of the computer, it basically holds the data, the instructions which are required to process this data, intermediate results of processing and final results of processing before they are released to an output device. So basically the storage, uh, storage section or the memory component of a computer system takes incorporates these three things. Now it is very interesting to note how data is organized within a computer system. We all know that a computer is a binary device, binary meaning it processes all information in the forms of zeros and 1. When I am saying binary, I mean bi which means 2, neri means numbers. So here we have the basic unit of memory which is called as the binary digit or bit which is either a 0 or a 1. Now a bit is the smallest unit of data within a computer. We combine 4 bits and it is called a nibble. 8 bits put together forms a byte and a combination of bytes is known as a word. When I say combination of bytes, I mean it could be 2, 4 or 8 bytes. Now one byte is the smallest unit of data which is handled by a computer at any given time. When I say one byte, so I mean that it can store up to 256 different combinations of zeros and ones. Therefore, it can be used to represent 256 different symbols. So what we are saying is that one byte of 8 bits is capable of representing 256 different symbols within a computer system. So these could range from all zeros to a maximum of all ones. A group of bytes can be further combined to form a word. As I told you earlier, a word can be 2, 4 or 8 bytes. Now basically the word length is the determinant of the computer's processing speed. The bigger the word length, the maximum, the more the word length, the higher processing the computer can do, the faster processing the computer can do. So therefore, a supercomputer may have a word length which is much higher than a normal desktop computer that we are using. This slide which I am seeing showing you now, this is representing the concept of a nibble, a byte and a word. As you can see, 4 bits put together called a nibble. 8 bits or 2 nibbles form 1 byte and in this case I am showing a word length of 2 bytes that is 16 bits. So how is computer memory organized? Computer memory is logically organized as a linear array of locations. So it ranges from a maximum address of 0 to the maximum size of the memory. The next slide which I am showing you shows how data is organized or how memory 
is used to store data in a computer system. These are two different uh, forms of organization of data in the memory. One is called the big endian assignment, the other is called the little endian assignment of data into the memory. Now, these are a few commonly generally used terms like you generally we uh, how do you measure memory. So, we say that 1 bit of course, we discuss that is 0 or 1, 1 byte which is 8 bits, 1 kilobyte or kb which is 10, 2 to the power 10 bytes. So, it becomes 1024 bytes. Similarly, we have 1 megabyte which is equal to 2 to the power 20 kilobytes, 1 gigabyte which is 2 to the power 30 bytes which is again 1024 megabytes and 1 terabyte which is 2 to the power 40 bytes that is 1024 or 1024 gigabytes. Now, when we talk about characteristics of memory, the two main important characteristics of memory is the capacity and the access time. Capacity of the memory means how much information, the amount of information that can be stored in the memory and access time implies to the time between the request of the data and the time the data is made available. So, a memory which has the storage capacity is more and the access time is less is the desirable memory that is what we aim towards. So, basically the organization of computer memory is done on the basis of cost benefit analysis. Like we have different types of memories which are arranged in different amounts so that we can achieve the maximum output of the computer system at the same time not escalating the cost of the computer system to become uneconomical. Therefore, we talk about a system where we have different categories of memory depending on their access time and their storage space and also one major implication is on the cost side of it. So, the lesser the access time, the faster is the speed of the memory. We want a memory with faster speed and largest capacity. As I just told, the cost of the faster memory is again very high. Therefore, we need different types of memories like we are going to discuss registers, cache, primary memory which are the semiconductor based memories, magnetic tapes, disks are secondary memories. Now, this is a very interesting slide. This shows the different categories of different types of memories with their access time and the cost vis-a-vis -vis the cost of the memory. So, as we can see in the pyramid, the lowest is the magnetic tape which has the highest access time but the least cost. This is followed by the disk which have still less access time and they are still more costlier and then you have the main memory, then we have the cache and then we have the registers. So, registers are basically the lowest access time, the fastest of computer memory which is the most expensive. This again is another diagram which represents memory hierarchy where we show how input sources of data are and the CPU are related to the computer different types of computer memories. So, we see that the secondary storage devices they have an indirect access to the CPU whereas the RAM, cache and the CPU registers they have direct access to CPU. Important thing to note here is that the electronic memories like the RAM, the cache and the CPU registers they are temporary. They have data, they hold data only till the time it the power is supplied to a computer system. As soon as the power goes off, the contents of the temporary storage areas they will be deleted. So, therefore, we have permanent storage areas in the form of secondary storage devices like the magnetic disks, the hard disks, the tapes and some auxiliary storage devices. So, this diagram basically shows how the CPU access 
is provided to the different kinds of memory and which memory can directly access CPU. Of course, the memories which can access the CPU directly are faster whereas those which are like secondary memories they are much slower memories. They, their access time is much higher because they do the CPU cannot access data directly from these components of the computer system or the memory. Again this slide shows the relationship and the size relative size approximate size of the different types of memories like we have the hard disks which are now generally coming in terabytes and they have an access time of about 5 to 20 milliseconds. Then we have the dynamic RAM which has a size in gigabytes 1 or 2 GB and the access time is 50 to 70 nanoseconds. Static RAM is higher which is generally used as cache memory where the access time varies from 0.5 to 2.5 nanoseconds and the highest is CPU registers where the access time is less than 1 nanosecond and the size is about 100 bytes. Of course, needless to say that the storage space provided by the disk will be the largest whereas that provided by the registers will be the least or the minimum. So, memory hierarchy talks about internal and external memory which are the two broad categories of memory. The same diagram which we have seen the pyramids they actually represent the memory hierarchy. The internal memory consists of the CPU registers, cache and primary memory. It is used by the CPU to perform computing tasks. The external memory is called secondary memory. It is used to store large amount of data and software which cannot be held in the temporary memory. So, we are talking about the characteristics of internal memory. So, the internal memory is characterized by limited storage area, fast access time, temporary storage, high cost. So, these types of memory they comprise basically registers, cache and RAM. The speed of the registers as just now discussed is about 1 to 2 nanoseconds. The sum of the size of registers is less than 200 bytes. Next is cache in the hierarchy which is placed between the CPU and the main memory. The speed of the cache is between 2 to 10 nanoseconds and its size varies from 32 kilobytes to 4 megabytes. The primary memory is next in hierarchy. Now primary memory is relatively lower, slower than the cache memory. The speed of the primary memory or the RAM is about 60 nanoseconds and its size varies from 512 KB to about 3 GB. External memory of the computer, this is very high storage, this is the secondary storage areas, this is very high storage capacity, it is permanent storage, slower access, cheap, less cost and it stores data which is not currently being used by the CPU. So, these are basically the tapes and the magnetic disks. Now, what we are saying actually is that you have a small temporary memory which is electronic, which is temporary, which will hold data only till the time power is supplied to the computer system. After the, after the, when you feel like closing the computer system, shutting it down or due to any reason, if the computer shuts down, whatever content is there in the registers, cache or RAM will be deleted, will not be available once the system is restarted. Therefore, what we need is a very enormous secondary storage area which is permanent. So, once your work is done, what you do is you save your data. When you are saying you save your data, what you are doing is that you are transferring the data from a temporary RAM to a permanent hard disk. Therefore, this is this kind of structure works well because you have a fast but temporary storage area which is small in size because of the cost you keep it small and then you have a cheap large memory which holds data rather permanently. So, therefore, this, the, the movement of data keeps coming in and out. 
Important thing to remember is that the CPU will only access the data once it is in the primary memory, once it is in the electronic memory, the RAM or the cache or the registers. It will never access data directly from the hard disk. The data has to be brought into the RAM from the hard disk for CPU to access it. So this we were discussing about external memory. So in external memory you have different types of memory like I discussed magnetic tape and magnetic disks. So optical disks are also there. Now the speed of the disk is around 60 milliseconds where and the capacity may vary from 160 uh, gigabytes to about 1600 gigabytes. Now this is an important slide which shows how different types of memories are organized with, within the CPU. As you can see within the CPU is the registers and the cache memory which is directly accessible by the CU and the ALU. The RAM is connected to the CPU through a memory bus but it is not within the CPU, it is outside the CPU. Then we have the secondary storage devices which are connected to the CPU through the input output channels and then of course you have the auxiliary storage like the DVD <coughs> or the CD drives. So what is the purpose of the memory hierarchy? To get fastest speed with largest capacity and least cost. Fast memory is located close to the processor. The secondary memory which is not as fast is used to store information permanently <coughs> and is placed farthest from the processor. <coughs> With respect to CPU, the memory is organized as follows. So we have seen that registers are placed inside the CPU, they are small capacity, high cost and high speed. Cache memory is placed next to the registers which is also part within the CPU. Then we have the primary memory and the secondary memory which is farthest from the CPU. So as I just said the CPU cannot access the data directly from the secondary memory. Now the speed of the memory is dependent on the technology which is used for the memory. The registers, cache and primary memory are semiconductor based memories. These do not have any moving parts and therefore they are really fast memories. Whereas the secondary memories they have moving parts and have they have moving parts and therefore they, they are rather slow. These secondary memories are slow because they have moving parts. There are disks which have to rotate. There is a tape which has to move. Therefore, these are slow. And the electronic memories like the RAM or the cache or the registers, they are fixed, they are electronic in nature, they maintain data due to the presence of voltage or current within the system. So now we are going to discuss in detail about the CPU registers. So they are very high speed memory areas which are located inside the CPU. After the CPU gets the data and instructions from the cache or RAM, these are moved to the registers for processing. Registers are manipulated directly by the control unit of CPU during instruction execution. Registers are referred to as the working memory of the CPU because they are directly, they are di the data in the registers is directly read by the CPU. All instructions and data is directly read by the CPU. Now the number of registers in a CPU and the size of the registers will affect the power of the power and speed of the CPU. The more the number of registers and the higher the size of the registers, the faster or more efficient a computer system will become, the better the computer system will become. Now we have a very interesting type of memory that we call as the cache memory. Now the problem is that we have a CPU which is very fast. We have registers which work almost as fast as the CPU but their capacity is very low. The storage capacity of registers is very low. Therefore, we and the capacity of the RAM which is the other primary memory 
is the storage capacity is higher than the registers, much higher than the registers, but the speed is much lower than the CPU. So, we are saying that there is a great mismatch of speed between the CPU and the RAM. So, if the speed mismatch is not overcome, then the overall speed of the computer system will come down to a great extent. Therefore, to minimize this speed mismatch between the CPU and the RAM, we put a high speed but small capacity cache memory in between the two. So, what happens is that the data from the RAM comes into the cache and from the cache it is read by the CPU. The, there is a principle called locality of reference which is used in transferring data from RAM to cache that is the data which is most commonly used, most commonly referred to by the CPU is kept inside the cache. If the data is not accessed for some time, it is moved out of the cache and some new block of data is brought into the cache memory. So, the CPU first looks for the data in the cache memory and if it finds the data, it is called a cache hit. In case the data what the CPU is looking for is not available in the cache, it is then referred to the RAM. So, the data is brought from the RAM to the cache and in this case because the data was not found in the cache in the first place, therefore this situation is known as a cache miss. So, these two terms are very important cache hit and cache miss. If there is a cache miss, then the information will be referred to or will be retrieved from the RAM. The content of the cache is actually decided by another component which is known as the cache controller. The most recently accessed information help the controller to guess the RAM location that may be accessed next. So, therefore, it decides on cache misses. So, the, the less the number of misses, the efficient the computer system will become. So, it is the duty of the cache controller to fetch in the correct data from the RAM so that the number of mi cache misses is minimized. Now, this slide here shows how the CPU accesses the data from the cache. You can see that there is a cache controller whose duty is to get the data from the main memory. So, if the CPU is able to find the data from the cache memory, it is said to be a cache hit. But if the data is not found, it is the duty of the cache controller to then refer to the main memory that is the primary RAM, mem RAM memory and it gets the data to the cache and then the CPU can read that data. So, this situation is known as the cache miss. Now, further there are different types of cache memories also depending on their size and their position within the CPU. So, there is L1 cache, there is L2 cache and there is L3 cache. L1 cache can be accessed almost as fast as the registers typically in 1 or 2 clock cycles. L2 cache this this is this is more distant from the CPU due to even more increasing gap between CPU and the main memory. Additional cache that is L2 cache is inserted between L1 cache and the main memory which is accessed in fewer clock cycles. So, we are trying to say that L1 cache is as almost as fast as the CPU itself. L2 cache is still slower than the L1 cache. And then we have the L3 or the third level cache which, <coughs> which is available in some high performance system which sits in between the L2 cache and the main memory. Now, this slide shows how the three caches are inserted in between the CPU and the main memory. The L1 cache is the closest to the CPU and it is the fastest. Then comes the L2 cache or the level 2 cache which is still faster. Then the least fast is the L3 cache 
or the level 3 cache and then there is main memory which is slow, slow in the uh, with respect to the speed of the CPU. So, RAM is now basically we are going to discuss about this is the internal memory that we have discussed about that is the cache and the RAM memory, cache sorry cache and the registers. Now, we are going to discuss about the two other main types of memories that is the RAM and the ROM memories, the read only memory and the random access memory. So, random access memory is the temporary storage of the uh, storage of input output data and intermediate results. The input data is entered in the computer using the input device, it is stored in the RAM for processing. After processing the output data is stored in RAM before being sent to the output device. So, basically what we are trying to say is that the RAM act as an intermediary between the input device and the CPU when the input of data is happening and acts as an intermediary during the output of data when it is happening at the time when data is being transferred from the CPU to the output devices that is the monitor <coughs> or the printer. So, it stores data and instruction during operation of the computer. Data and instructions are first brought into the RAM from the secondary storage devices, then CPU interacts with the RAM. Now, one very important characteristic of the RAM memory is said to be that it is volatile in nature. The term volatile refers to the fact that the data in the RAM will only remain up to the point when power is supplied to it. As soon as power goes off, the contents of the RAM memory are erased from the computer. Therefore, in order to retain the files that we want, we have to save them. Saving the file means that you are transferring the data from the RAM or the random access memory which is volatile in nature to the secondary storage area. It is important to note that in certain computers in uh, not with, with, with a little obsolete technology, they may only be doing well with a random access memory and the, <coughs> the computers are working quite well. So, important one important point here to mention is the meaning of the word random access. Random access means that the data can be accessed at the same time irrespective of the location of the data within the memory. That is it provides random access to the stored words, bytes or larger data units. Use it requires same amount of time to access information from RAM irrespective of where it is located. RAM can be read from and written to with the same speed. The opposite of random access is sequential access. So, sequential access means that the location of the data will determine its access time. If the data is read from a location which is closer to the read write head, it will be read quickly whereas, if it is at a distant place, it will take a time because all the previous records have to be traversed in order to go to the first record or in order to go to the desired record. So, there is a difference between sequential access and random access devices. So, RAM therefore becomes fast because in order to reach to any particular given record, you need not travel to the other records, you need not traverse to the other records, you only have to go directly to the record which you want to go to. So, the size of the RAM is limited in GB or MB, it can be it can vary from up to 2 GB to 3 GB also. Minimum RAM which is available in the computers is about 512 KB. Thank you.
So, we will continue with the topic that is random access memory. So, we were discussing a few features of the random access memory. We had seen that it is a volatile low storage and fast access memory faster than the secondary storage devices. Now, the performance of RAM is basically affected by two parameters. One is the access speed that is how quickly information can be retrieved. It is measured in nanoseconds. Data transfer unit size that is how much information can be retrieved in one request. Now, RAM affects the speed and power of a computer. More the RAM, better it is. Faster the RAM, better the computer will be. It is generally, it has a general capacity of about 512 MB to 4 GB. RAM is a microchip implemented using a semiconductor. Now, the random access memory also is available as two variants. One is static RAM and the other is dynamic RAM. These are generally known as SRAM and DRAM. So, the first type of RAM that we are going to discuss is the dynamic RAM or the DRAM. Now, DRAM has a memory cell which is composed of capacitors. Dynamic itself means which is changing, which keeps on changing. So, it is mainly used as a small main memory because it is small and cheap. It uses a combination of transistors and capacitors. The transistors are arranged in a matrix of rows and columns and the capacitor holds the bit of information 0 and 1. The transistors and capacitors are paired to make the memory cell. Now, the transistors act as a switch that lets the control circuitry on the memory chip to read the capacitor or change its state. The capacitor can store an electrical charge to represent a 1 or no charge and a 0 for no charge for 0. Each cell is connected to an address line and a data line. Now, because there are capacitors which are used in the dynamic RAM, therefore, they constantly require to refresh them. And because of this refreshing, the overall speed of the memory comes down. It becomes slower than the static RAM. <coughs> A pulse sent along an address line turns on the transistors on the line. Pulses representing information are then sent along the data lines charging the capacitors. The information is read when the cells discharge sending pulses back along the data lines. Now, this shows an integrated chip for the RAM for the dynamic RAM. We can see that there are capacitors, there is a line where capacitors need to be charged, transistors, there is a data line which is represented using 0 and there is an address line. So, the transistors are off, the capacitors need to be charged and refreshed again and again. So, DRAM must be refreshed continually to store information. For this, a memory controller is used. The controller recharges all capacitors holding a 1 before they discharge. The memory controller reads the memory and then writes it right back. The access speed of the DRAM is about 50 to 150 nanoseconds. Next we discuss is the static RAM. So, as opposed to the dynamic RAM where we saw that capacitors are used, a static RAM is using only transistors, multiple transistors about 4 to 6 transistors are used in each memory cell. It is used in cache memory due to its high speed. It does not have a capacitor in each cell. It has more parts, so it takes more space on a chip than DRAM cell. It does not need constant refreshing, so it is faster than the DRAM. Of course, it is more expensive than the DRAM. It stores information as long as power is supplied to it. Even though there are no capacitors, the dynamic RAM 
like the dynamic RAM, the static RAM is also volatile. It will only hold the data till the time power is supplied to it. <coughs> SRAM is easier to use, it is very fast, it has an access speed of about 2 to 10 nanoseconds. The memory chips are available on a separate printed circuit board which is generally known as a PCB that is plugged into a special connector on the motherboard. The static RAM is of two types, single inline memory module that is called the SIM and the dual inline memory module which is known as the DIM. It depends on how the chips are placed on the computer's motherboard. The single inline memory module or the SIM, it have memory chips on one side of the printed circuit board. It can store up to 8 to 32 bits of data simultaneously. The dual inline memory module, it have memory chips on both sides of the printed circuit boards and they can store up to 64 bits of memory. Therefore, the dual inline memory module or the DIM has twice the capacity of the single inline memory module or the SIM type of static memory. It is important to note that SRAM is generally used to make or is generally used to manufacture or work as the computer's cache memory. So, cache memory is internally implemented using the SRAM. Next type of memory that we are going to discuss is the read only memory. Now, this is a very important type of memory that we will be talking about as the name itself implies that it is a read only. Read only means that no changes can be made to the memory. So, if no changes can be made to the memory, then it is important for a person to know what is stored in the memory and who stores it. So, basically read only memory is programmed by the manufacturers. The manufacturers of the circuits or the chips, they program the read only memory. Of course, now we have different variants of the read only memory that we will be looking on. So, basically read only memory is a permanent area, permanent memory which does not lose its contents when the power is switched off. That is, it is a permanent memory unlike random access memory which loses its contents when the power is turned off. The capacity of the read only memory is higher than that of the random access memory. So, unlike RAM, data once stored in the read only memory will remain forever, it cannot be changed. So, we have a non volatile read only memory which comes programmed by the manufacturers. So, it stores standard processing programs that permanently reside in the computer. It stores the data needed for the startup of the computer. The instructions that are required for initializing the devices attached to a computers when they are stored in the RAM. So, this slide shows the different types of different variants of read only memory which are there. So, the first is manufacturer programmed read only memory. So, in this case the data is burnt by the manufacturer of the electronic equipment which is used. Next is the programmable read only memory or the PROM. So, here the user can load and store read only programs and data in it. Next is EPROM or the erasable programmable read only memory. The user can erase information stored in it and the chip can be reprogrammed to store new information. Then we have the ultraviolet erasable programmable read only memory. So, this uses ultraviolet light to erase the data from the memory and then program it again. Then is the electrically erasable programmable read only memory or the EEPROM which is also commonly known as the flash memory. The type of 
electrically erasable programma programmable read only memory chip in which the stored information is erased by using high voltage electrical pulses. So, the programmable read only memory can be programmed with special tools, but after it has been programmed once the contents cannot be changed. It memories have thousand, this memory has thousands of fuses, a high voltage current of about 12 volt is applied to the fuses to be burnt. The burnt fuses correspond to 0 and the others which are not burnt they correspond to 1. So, basically the programmable read only memory is programmable only once. Once the data has been burnt on the chip it cannot be redone. And this programmable, this slide shows uh, the image of a programmable read only memory chip. Then we have the EEPROM or the <coughs> erasable programmable read only memory. It is programmed in a similar way as programmable read only memory, but it can be erased by exposing it to ultraviolet light and reprogrammed. EEPROM chips have to be removed from the computer from for rewriting because they are programmed using ultraviolet light. So, that can harm the other components within the motherboard. Therefore, special equipment is required to expose the areas of the read only memory to the ultraviolet light and from there it is brought back and fitted into the computer. It must be noted that specific high level of specialization is required for the programmer to be a programmable programmer for the read only memory. So, this is the image of an electronic erasable programmable read only memory chip. Then we have the electrically erasable programmable read only memory. This can be <coughs> erased by electrical current and reprogram. It does not need to be removed from the computer for rewriting. While it is in the computer system, it is fitted there, current may be supplied, the specific voltage may be supplied and using that the contents may be erased and new contents may be added to it. This type of memory we will be discussing is very commonly used and is known as a flash memory. So, this picture shows an EEPROM which is used in a number of places and EEPROM as I just said is also used also named as a flash memory. This is a semiconductor based non volatile rewritable computer memory that can be electrically erased and reprogrammed. This is a specific type of EEPROM. The flash memory actually is a very special type of memory because it combines the features of both random access memory as well as read only memory. Random access because the memory, the contents of this can be accessed randomly and read only memory because it is not volatile. The data which is once stored in the flash memory remains there it does not get erased. So, it stores bits of data in memory cells, high speed memories, durable and low energy consumption. It has no moving parts and it is very shock resistant. So, flash memory is generally used in digital cameras, mobile phones, printers, laptops and all kinds of playback devices like mp3 etc. It is a very crucial type of memory. So, these are a few pictures which show the flash memory and the memory card which is used in multiple portable devices because it is very lightweight it is used in portable devices like digital cameras and mobile phones. Now, another important aspect of the read only memory is that it stores a very important component of the operating system of the computer that is known as the basic input output system or the BIOS. Now, what is BIOS actually? When the computer is turned on, 
the computer's hardware needs to get instructions as to they have to start now. So, BIOS is the first program which gets loaded into the RAM, it is a component of the operating system which gets loaded into the RAM and then it instructs all the other devices that the computer has to be booted or the computer has to be started. Now, this BIOS is generally put or it is generally stored on a specific chip known as the read only memory. Now, what is the requirement for loading the BIOS on the ROM and not on the hard disk or not ported with the other operating system? Because one thing is that ROM is an electronic memory, so it will work much faster. Second is that being stored on a read only medium, it will prevent any kind of accidental change which may occur to the program, to the software due to accidental change by the user, by a naive user. So, therefore, it may prevent the system from booting properly. Therefore, these important instructions which are required for the computer to start, they are stored in the form of the BIOS on the ROM chip. Now, what does a BIOS provide actually? The BIOS provides a processor with the information which is required to boot the system like the settings and resources that are available on the system. BIOS is a permanent part of the system. BIOS does not load from the disk, but instead it is stored on a in a ROM memory chip. The program code in BIOS differs from ordinary software since it acts as an integral part of the computer. Basically, BIOS acts as an interface between the computer hardware and the software on the other devices which are connected to the system. Now, there are important functions which are performed by BIOS. One of them is power on self test, which is generally known as POST. Now, power on self test is a program which runs automatically when the system is booted. BIOS performs the power on self test. It checks that the major hardware components are working properly. BIOS setup program that is a built in utility in BIOS lets the user set the many functions that control how the computer works. BIOS also displays the system settings and finds the bootable device. It loads the interrupt handlers and device drivers. It also initializes the registers. Bootstrap loader is a program whose purpose is to start the computer software for operation when the computer, when the power is turned on. Bootstrap loader loads the operating system onto the RAM and launches it. It generally seeks the operating system on the hard disk. It generally seeks the, uh, it generally loads the operating system actually on the hard disk loader resides in the ROM. BIOS initiates the bootstrap sequence. So, this is, these are the main functions of the BIOS which is stored on the random, on the read only memory. So, we have covered a major portion of the computer's memory that is the primary memory of the computer which includes the read only memory the random access memory, the cache memory and the registers. All these four comprise the primary memory or the electronic components of the computer memory, electronic parts of the computer memory. The next portion of the computer memory is the secondary memory which includes the magnetic disks and the magnetic tapes or the secondary storage devices. So, what is the main characteristic of the secondary storage device? Actually, secondary storage devices are used to overcome the drawbacks of the primary storage device. Now, the main drawbacks of the primary storage device is that they have a low storage <coughs> capacity and they have a high cost. So, to overcome these two, the secondary storage devices, they have a very high storage capacity and a low cost. 
the cost per bit of storage on secondary storage devices is much much less as compared to the primary devices. The most commonly used secondary storage devices today are hard disks. They come in various options. Then of course, you also have magnetic tapes and optical disks etc. which are used as auxiliary storage devices. So, the <coughs> secondary storage devices they store very large amount of data and information for extended periods of time. The data and instructions stored in secondary storage must be fetched into the RAM before processing is done by the CPU. So, magnetic tapes, magnetic disk drives, optical disk drives and magneto optical disk drives are some of the commonly used secondary storage devices. Now, there are two types of storage devices which are considered in case of secondary storage. One is sequential access and the other is direct access. Sequential access as I already explained, sequential access devices where the common example is magnetic tape. So, these locate a particular piece of data depending on its location. It is very similar to the example of a cassette player. In a few years back when we, you ha when we used to have tape recorders where we had the cassette player. So, in order to go to track number 5 you had to rewind or you had to forward and traverse all 1, 2, 3 and 4 tracks then only you could reach to track number 5. So, that kind of an access mechanism is known as sequential access mechanism. Whereas, direct access mechanism is something like we have in the CDs today, where directly you can choose which track to play and the track can be played without the need for traversing any of the records before the desired record. So, in order to locate a particular piece of data in sequential access devices, the computer must run through all the previous records in sequence starting from the beginning. So, you have to follow the sequence of the record, you cannot jump the sequence. Direct access devices, any piece of data can be accessed in a non-sequential manner by locating it using the data's address. There is no predefined order in which data can be read or written. So, magnetic disks, optical disks and magneto optical disks are some examples of direct access devices which are used in the computers. So, these are the pictures which show the magnetic tape and <coughs> a common cassette. So, we are going to discuss about the magnetic tape. So, what is a magnetic tape? Basically, it is a plastic tape which has a magnetic coating. It is a storage medium on a large open reel or in a small cartridge or cassette. They are cheaper, durable and can be written, erased and rewritten easily. It needs to be rewound or moved forward to the location where the requested data is positioned in the tape. Because of its sequential nature, it is not useful for data files that need to be revised or updated often or transfer data from one system to the other. Magnetic film is deposited on a very thin 0.5 or 0.25 inch wide plastic tape. So, a magnetic coating is made on the tape on which the data is stored. Now, how basically how a tape works? It is divided horizontally into tracks about 7 to 9 tracks and vertically into frames. A frame stores 1 byte of data, a track stores in a frame 1 bit. Data is stored in successive frames as a string with 1 data per frame. 7 or 9 bits are recorded in parallel across the width of the tape. A separate read write head is provided for each bit position on the tape. In order to read or write all bits on the tape, they need to traverse parallelly. The characters need to be, the read write head need to move parallelly. Now, this slide shows a portion of the magnetic tape where you can see the vertical frames are there and the horizontal 7 tracks are there. 
So, where a track and the frame meet, there one byte of data can be, one bit of data can be stored on the frame. So, data is recorded on tape in the form of blocks, where a block consists of a group of data also called records. Each block is read continuously. There is an inter record gap or IRG between two blocks that provide time for the tape to be stopped and started between records. <coughs> this diagram shows how records are stored on a tape and in between there is an inter record gap. So, basically the read write head will only stop at the inter record gap not in between the two. So, we have different types of file systems where these, in, uh, these tapes are used Windows XP and 2000 they use the NTFS file system which offers better security and increased performance. It allows using file names that are more than 8 characters long. My dear friends, on that note, you would like to thank Dr. Pavitra Bhardwaj for coming to our show and we hope that with today's lecture, you have been able to understand the concept of computer memory and you have been able to understand in details what computer memory incorporates and what it is all about. On that note, thank you dear friends watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you. Mm -hmm.